Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of The Articulate Fly. On this episode, fly fishing legend Davey Watton returns for part two of our conversation. Davey generously spent almost three hours with me at the end of 2023 discussing what it means to be a complete angler and how to get there. This is part two of our conversation. There's a link to part one in the show notes. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. But before we get to the interview, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you like the podcast, please tell a friend and please subscribe and leave us a rating review in the podcatcher of your choice. It really helps us out. And check out our Patreon community. It's a great way to support the show and our many partners. We have everything from discounts on tying materials and guide trips to small group classes. And thanks to everyone who spent time with us on the show circuit in Denver, Edison, and Ypsilanti. It's always great to spend time with our listeners and friends. And a shout out to this episode's sponsor. This episode's sponsored by our friends at Norvice. Their motto is, tie better flies faster. And they produce the only vice that truly spins. The Norvice team continues to rack up the miles. Next stops are the fly fishing shows in Bellevue and Pleasanton. You owe it to yourself to drop by the Norvice booth to see the only vice that truly spins for yourself. Not going to be in Washington or California? No worries. Norvice's entire 2024 show schedule is up on their website. Head over to www.nor-vice.com today to see if the Norvice team will be coming to a town near you. Now, on to our interview. You know, a lot of my customers don't fish that much during the year. And the reason being, they don't live close to a water that uh, allows them that access to, you know, drive down the road a couple of hours, go fishing and come back home. You know, they have to travel fairly significant different distances to do so, or their their work routine doesn't allow them. So that also is a restriction. You know, how much time can you actually put on the water in a given year? Do you live local? Are you retired? Can you go there every damn day if you want? Or not the case. So you may only end up going, whatever, four or five days a year. Or I've got customers like that. You know, they can only fish three or four days a year, but they come and fish with me for those three or four days. And then pretty much they don't fish for the rest of the year. Does that limit their ability to become well-rounded, more skillful anglers? Yes, of course it does, because they don't spend the time on the water. And that's something you have to do. Going back to what we've been discussing, regardless of whether you live by the river, you can go there every day. Does that necessarily relate to the fact that you become a much more skillful angler? Not necessarily so. It depends on you. You know, are you once again an observant angler? Do you understand what's going on on that river? Every day you go there, every day could be different. Okay, so. You're going at a time when there's a period of emergencies, be they caddis, mayflies, or stoneflies, or what. Well, you should be aware of that. You know, even somebody that is not, shall we say, a skillful angler should have some awareness of that. You would assume, okay, you know, I saw these bugs, you know, this, that, and the other. Uh, they should also develop, you would assume, an, an awareness of what flies to use and how to present those flies to catch those fish. But you know what? They may well have terrible casting skills and they don't catch those fish because they don't have the ability to present those flies in, a, in a, an acceptable manner to the fish. And I know that is a common issue with a lot of people that fly fish. I know that for a fact. I watch them. I don't say anything to them. Well, I don't believe it's my place to do that. But, you know, when I'm, when I'm there myself, you know, I just watch people and see what they're doing and Stuff like that, you know, and I'll give you another example, you know, a little while ago, and this is something I see on a frequent basis, I might add. I was um, weight fishing myself, and um, there was a couple of guys there fishing downstream for me. I'm not joking. They must have been using the indicator that would stun a 10-pound trout if it hit them on the head. They had a huge <laughs> indicator. No, I'm not joking, right? <laughs> and they're fishing in skinny water, about 18 inches deep, where the fish there in that particular area of the river, which I know well, ultimately all they're eating is little tiny coronamies and probably little scuds, which are roughly about a size 16 or 18. But here they are, 
banging this out in the water. And they must have been doing that at least for an hour. An hour. I could see, you could see that indicator 100 yards away. I, I guarantee you, a huge thing. I could have gone down there and given him a lesson, say, hey, you know, you're wasting your time doing this, that, and the other. And that, you know, I just don't always do that. You know, sometimes I might, you know, but generally, ultimately, it amounted to this that those two guys had never had any, what I call, significant instruction about how to approach what they were doing. They probably just went into a the fly shop or some store and bought these big bubble indicators. I've no doubt they acquired some flies from some source or whatever and went out there and started doing their own thing without no chance of success whatsoever. Did they make a fatal mistake? Of course they did. They should have gone and got at least some instruction. Most of the fly shops that I know of are only too prepared to give somebody free instruction. You can become a member of your local fly fishing club, like we have here. We have a huge fly fishing club here in Mount Home, or TU. I guarantee you there'll be guys there that will help you, and it won't cost you nothing. Or you can come attend the um, the classes, and some of which you would have to pay for. Obviously, you know, if you want to come and be a participant in some of the classes that I do, you're going to pay for for it. Because why? That's my profession. I spent my life learning what I know. I didn't get paid for everything I learned. I can assure I spent thousands and thousands of hours fishing and doing what I know today, to learn what I know today. Nobody, I'm not saying I didn't learn from other people. Of course I did. Um, and everybody that fishes has. You can't say otherwise. But you develop, obviously, over and above those levels of skills that other people have taught you and taught you, shall we say, and you benefit from that. Everybody else has. And you can pass that on to another person, which is what it's all about. So I was just making that case as an example of what I saw there a few weeks ago, and it's not something that I don't see on a frequent basis because I do. And the other one, you know, I said earlier on is the heron stance. I was fishing a zone on our river here. It was a catch and release trophy zone a little while ago. And there was two guys fishing on the shoal at the top end of that particular section of the river. They were there for at least two hours. I was boat fishing, drift fishing, incidentally. So, you know, I'd, I'd run upstream and I'd drift downstream a good ways and I'd come back up and we'd do that. But they never moved. They stayed there for about two hours. I saw one of those guys catch a fish in all the time I was, you know, close enough to see what the hell they were up to. But they never moved. And I'm thinking, once again, you need to go and get something to teach you more about what you need to know, which is you don't stand there more or less for two hours repeatedly doing the same thing within a relative distance of your casting zone over and over and over again. Fish ain't stupid. They're just not going to react to what you're doing half an hour later from when you started. It's not going to happen. So there are so many things like that. You know, I think, well, I know, you know, that um, most fly fishermen do want to learn better skill levels. There's, there's no argument about that. And most certainly, as you well know, they come to me, they want to learn the arts and methods, science and skills of fishing, wet fly. And there's a lot more to that than people realize. It, it's far more than just casting the flies across stream and stripping them back. That, that, that's probably 10 or 15% of the knowledge and skills of fishing those styles of flies. But again, I have to say that unless you have good developed casting skills, you're going to have a problem because where you're legally allowed to do it, in some places you can, you may be restricted to one fly or say like in Montana, legally only two, you may be able to fish three or four or more flies than you want. Here you can, you know, you fish six flies on a leader system here if you wanted to. But nevertheless, in order to do that, you have to develop 
casting skills to be able to do that because I know, believe me, I know, if I set somebody up with a three three fly dropper rig where you've got in the region of somewhere between 12 to 14 feet of overall leader length of that fly line with dropper flies that are spaced approximately 30 inches apart, they don't take five minutes and then tangle them up. Why? Because they're their casting skill. That's it. You have to understand how to cast in such a manner as you do not cause those flies to tangle up. More to the point, you've got to be able to present those flies in a manner whereby you can thereafter control how those flies are fished and control that drift and more to the point, know exactly at what point of time a fish has took your flies and you raise your own hook fish. And it takes a lot of practice to do that. You know, contrary to what you might think, Granted, if you're going to chuck flies across stream, the, the fish does the work for you. It's going to grab the fly and you're going to feel it pull on it, boom, and you may or may not get it. The most common error, of course, when people fish like that but downstream is they react instantly to the feel of the fish take the fly. And guess what? They pull it out of its mouth or it's on there momentarily and it gets out. There's a lot more to that skill when you are fishing downstream that uh, doesn't cause that situation to happen. Let's put it like that. So regardless, you know, and I'm going back to something I talked about a little earlier on here, you know, where nymph fishing is concerned, is it absolutely always necessary to fish nymphs on and near the bed of the river? Absolutely not. I can tell you now that fishing uh, soft tackles, by that means or method, can be exceptionally deadly. In other words, what you're doing, you're fishing them in the same manner as you would present, shall we say, uh, upstream to in front and or downstream a nymph. The only thing is, you've got to get those flies, not all the time, near or close to the bed of the river. That's far from the truth, to be honest about it, But because when you're fishing two or three flies like that. It enables you to fish them at different levels within that water column. And it's not always the case that flies have to be within six inches of the bed of the river before the fish will react to them. That's absolutely not true. Obviously, certain prevailing conditions may be related to that, you know, exceptionally cold water or something like that. But certainly when water temperatures warm, food can be seen by those fish in many different levels within that water column. It may not necessarily be the fact that it's related to a hatch. It may be what we define as biological stream drift, you know, where whatever it be, caddis lower, cutted bugs, you know, they drift downstream, they move to a different zone or whatever. I've seen times when I've seen loads of snails like that drifting down. You know, nobody quite understands, I guess, why they do it, but obviously they're moving and that's their natural means to do it. They drift downstream. So there's always things there that, you know, fish are aware of. You know, you get like a little fast riffle, for example, you know, and all of a sudden it churns up a bit of the bottom. And guess what? You know, the bugs get shifted off and they get churned around in those water columns and they get moved around. Don't think for one moment they all track close to the river bed because that's far from the truth. They don't. Anyway, the point of the matter is that you can fish soft tackle flies that cover different levels of depth in the water column as a dead drift mode as you would like for a nymph, in other words. But, you, of course, you, you generally wouldn't use an indicator. I know some people might do that, but I would say, tell you if that's how you're going to fish, you don't do that. Let's put it that way. You know why? Because you're adding something that can detract the fish from looking at your flies. And you all know that when you fish with an indicator, how many times do a fish come up and grab your indicator, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a reason for it. They see it, and they want to go up and investigate what it is. But if they did that, they weren't looking at the flies, right? Because you change their perception of vision to looking at your indicator instead of your flies. If you didn't have that indicator on, there's a very good chance they would tip your fly not the indicator. But my point of the matter is that you may be fishing in three, four, five, six, seven, eight feet of water, and I see that frequently when we drift fish anglers out here with indicators, 
a fish will come from the bed of the river and take that indicator or grab it on the surface. Why? Because they see it. What I'm trying to say is that if you adopt the uh, upstream approach, so far as fishing soft tackles are concerned, avoid using an indicator. Your fly line is your indicator. Obviously, if you're in what we call contact, in other words, close contact fishing, in other words, you're only recasting leader, kind of like the union fishing for that matter, you're, you're watching that for your uh, indicator take of a fish. If you're fishing further across stream, you watch the fly line. And another thing I might add here, big mistake by many anglers, their dry lines sink. If your dry line sinks, and I don't care how much you pay for a line, ultimately the factory finish of that line will start to wear off and your line will start to sink within the meniscus, i.e. the surface. If it does that, it ultimately will result in issues as far as effectively mending the line because as you start to try to move the line, you drag everything else because it's in the water. The most efficient way to be able to mend a fly line is that you mend it off the surface of the water. And the only efficient way to do that is to grease that line up so it does that. And there are a number of different products that you you can use. Personally, I use uh, mucin. I've used it all my life. And it requires... Obviously, you, you know, you must maintain your line to be kept clean and this, uh, the other. And there's one other thing, incidentally, I might add here. It will pay you at times to stretch your line. Uh, what ultimately will happen is that they, they kind of shrink somewhat and they don't lay straight. And, and not only that, it inhibits the line moving through your, your guides on your rod efficiently too. So, you know, if there's a friend of you go fishing, you know, just pull out 30, 40 feet line and very, very gently just Stretch that line. You'd be surprised how much it would actually stretch, maybe three or four foot. And then, of course, keep it clean. That, that's more the, an issue of guys that fish in the uh, warm water situations as opposed to, you know, good clean water like we have here on the White River or Spring Creek. But nevertheless, grease that line up so it floats on the surface. In fact, in the DVD I did on Mitch fishing, Mitch Magic fishing, I show clearly the difference between a line that's floating on the surface and one it is not. That if you try to move that fly line without moving that fly, if the line is in the water, the odds are you will not do it. You will drag that fly, instantly raise that rod. If that line is on the surface of the water, you can just kick and fix that rod tip and that line will just lift straight off the surface with little or no disturbance without causing disturbance to your place. So that's something you guys that are listening here should bear that in mind. Make sure that your fly line, dry line it, of course, always is visible on the surface and not in it. Okay, so going back there to um, what I was talking about, you know, it's sufficient with the, the soft tackle flies, and you may fish one, maybe two, maybe three. It's a means and methods of, of skill and presentation that, re- that requires time to become skillful at it, uh, as with anything else. Now, as far as um, the use of what we call the traditional wet flies, uh, let me just say this too. You know, here in America, you know, a, a, a wet fly, for the majority, is a fly that sinks. Right? Yeah, of course it is. If you uh, relate that over there in the UK where I'm from, what a wet fly is, they will know exactly what you're talking about. It is a traditional wing wet fly, whatever it be, you know, whether it be an Alexander, a Wickham Spencer, an Invictor, a Silver Invictor, a Butcher, a Dunkel, you name it. They will understand, yeah, I was fishing wet today. They know what you're meaning. If you're re- dealing with, uh, shall we say, the uh, shaft tackles and spiders, well, that's, of course, more related to the North Country style of fishing which almost always is pursued by fishing in a mode upstream, largely because you're fishing fast to shallow water streams and those fish intercept their food base as it comes down toward them, whereas, of course, in the slower 
even water systems like English talk streams, that's a different ball game. You know, there you can cast a nymph upstream of a trout. It'll drift past that trout two or three feet or more downstream, and all of a sudden that trout turn around, go downstream and take it. <laughs> that's a different scenario. So once again, observation is an issue. You know, under the prevailing conditions and the nature of the water you are fishing, what are those fish likely to do and how are they likely to respond to what it is you choose to want to do as far as catching them? So the answer really, you know, is there's more than one way to catch the same fish. But there's probably one way that's going to be more likely to do it than others. Because at any point of time, that trout, whilst it's in its watery world, is looking for something to eat. It may not matter that it's on or near the bed of the river. It's in the mid-water column. It's on or near the surface or on the surface. That fish is looking for something to eat. And bear in mind, we also have terrestrials that get blown onto the surface of the water. Doesn't matter, you know, whether they're beetles, whether they're hoppers or whether they're cicadas, whatever. There's always something in the environment of that fish's world that's going to instigate that fish to react to something that you are likely to do to catch it. If your approach is, shall we say, acceptable to the fish at that point of time. So the ultimately, I would say, you know, an all-round angler, if that's the way to say that, is a person, ultimately, that's an extremely observant person based on his own personal observations. Obviously, he's going to learn some of that from what he's told or what he's read, that this and the other, but Ultimately, I will tell you from my experience that the, the people that ultimately are the best at it, their personal observations are exceeding what others have said or told to them. In other words, they see it beyond that. Let's, let's, let's put it to you like that. In other words, put that into perspective. So I say to you, Marvin, yeah, go down the river today. You're going to see a hatch of uh, whatever it is, PMDs. Well, all I told you is when you go to the river, you're going to see some PMDs on the water, right? What what does that tell you? Well, oh, yeah, I'm going to see some PMDs on the river. Does that help you in, other, in any other way, so far as observation, so far as what you need to do to catch those fish that are feeding on them PMDs? What flies are you going to use? Not, what mode of presentation are you going to use? Are you going to fish a dry? you Are going to fish an emerger? Are you going to fish a nip or what, you know? So there's a limitation insofar as what somebody has told you of what you have read, which is not so much what the advanced angler has got. He's got greater observations when he gets there and knows what's going on. And that's based on, obviously, experience, a lot of it. There's no question about that. But any anyway, event, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the um, an angler... That is, shall we say, a skillful angler has, has somewhat got commanded or got the ability to fish pretty much all means and methods. He may not be, by any stretch of imagination, the most brilliant dry fly fisherman, but he may be a really good nymph fisherman. He may not be a good streamer fisherman, but yeah, he may be a good dry fly fisherman. And you, you almost always will find that um, one of those categories of, of fly fishing will be his, uh, be the one that he's really, really good at. Let's put it that way. That's not to say he's not, you know, bad in any sense of the word with other means or methods of fishing. It's just the one that really has a, fun, a greater fundamental understanding and, and has probably applied more of his knowledge and skills to, to become that good, you know, and that's, that's a fact, I, I, I can assure you. You know, um, I know guys, you know, that are exceptionally good casters and or fly tires, but they're really not that good anglers, uh, which is interesting, you know, because you would think, well, you know, the guy's a great caster, he also should be a good fisherman. Well, that's not true, you know, or he's a really good uh, uh, fly tire. 
you know, well, he should go to tie every damn fly in the book that catches fish. Uh, that's not necessarily necessarily true. Why? Because the act of physically fishing and catching fish is a totally different dimension to being a really good caster or a really good fly tire. However, a well-seasoned fly fisherman or what I would consider to be a real high-end class fly fisherman is good at those two things also. He's, he's pretty good at fly tying and he's pretty good at casting. Maybe not the world's expert, but nevertheless, he's got a greater fundamental understanding of that than, shall we say, overall the majority. You know, and I'll go back to telling you, you know, where Dave was concerned, you know, he unquestionably had got those skills to masterful levels. All of them. Whether he, innovation of flies, his ability to um, present those flies, he had a really, really good fundamental understanding of everything he did. Why? Because he'd spent a lot of time on that water fishing. I mean, thousands of hours. And I'll tell you the same thing. Unless you spend thousands of hours on the water, you're going to be somewhat limited. And I understand that, you know, but you, not for the majority of anglers, if the truth be known, they can still acquire skill levels that they don't have if they're prepared to put the time, the effort, and develop the knowledge and skills to do so. Whether they choose to want to do it, eh, that's another matter. As I think, you know, in many cases, you know, they like to go fishing. That's fine. They enjoy themselves and they catch and fish with the, you know, limitation of skills they've got. And that's okay. But I also have a mind to tell them, hey, you know what? There's a whole bunch more that you could do that will really change your insight into what it is you can do in the wonderful world of fly fishing. You follow what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I do. It's kind of interesting, too, because it's almost like we've come full circle because I think, you know, you have to have the skills, right? So you kind of put that off to the side. Oh, but yeah. but really, you know, it's kind of like you, you you have to understand the trout behavior and the food behavior to then inform how you need to present your flies to have the highest likelihood of catching the fish, right? Yeah, Absolutely. Yes. And so, and, yeah. So, I mean, even a, even a kind of an intermediate uh, skilled person or a person who can't fish a lot, if they think about the puzzle and saying, well, you know, it's April, I'm on this piece of water. This is what the trout should be doing. This is what the food should be doing. And then the question is, do they have the skills to present the fly in the best possible way? That's largely true. You know, once again, you know, I, I have to go back to saying, what you know, I've said a good bit here is that in order to um, improve your level of skill, you've got to do something other than what you, you you still do. In other words, granted, you accept the fact that that will catch you some fish, but you've got to develop other skills which relate to everything related to the physical act of fly fishing, be it casting, Understanding fish behavior, the food that the fish feed on, the best means of presentation, supplies of choice used, da 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 da. You're right? Because there's a whole big part of that equation that comes together to make it happen, i.e., the fish opens his mouth and take your fly. And then, you know, you asked me about selectivity of fish, which is a good question. Then, how does that affect your decision? or my decision, or whatever, what it is that you do. Most of the time, what we're dealing with as far as the word selectivity is that the fish at that particular point of time are somewhat zoned in on a specific species at a, various, a given stage of the life of that specific species. Mostly, related to emergence, emergency, because that is when you see the fish on or near the surface. The fact of the matter is, you don't really know what's going on subsurface unless you're in a situation where you're in a gene clear water like an English talk stream and you can watch them do it. For the most part, the waterways that we fish 
we don't or cannot see that. So that's beside the point insofar as selectivity is concerned, because as far as I'm concerned, the fish can be as selective on any of the bed of the river as they can on any of the surface. The difference is you don't see them on any of the bed of the river or less likely to. But you do see that visual on the surface. That's the difference. Either way, those fish can be difficult either way. And so, well, hey, when you get the guys in the pub at night, it's like, oh, shit, you know, I didn't catch none of those fish. They were selective. And I asked them, I said, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, they were selectively feeding. I said, yeah, well, you know what? The, the answer to the, the, the issue where you were concerned is you hadn't figured out how to catch them. It wasn't that the fish was doing something different in that respect. It was just doing what it would naturally do. You just hadn't figured out what it was you need to do to deceive them, which is what you're doing. You know, for the best will in the world, it doesn't matter what you tie in a piece of metal. And I can tie flies that are really, you know, anatomically correct, and they look really good. Hey, you know, why would the fish refuse that? The fact of the matter is they do. Strange enough, so the simplest flies are the ones that work more effectively than those that are glorious creations that took you half an hour to tie, which in my opinion, if you're spending that much time tired of flying the bites, <laughs> I forget it, right? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you need to find another hobby. You got too much time on your hands. <laughs> well, that's right. You know, that's right. If I was going to spend that much time in a, in a vice with a fly, I'm telling you now, I'm going to be tying somewhat not all, but part of a classic Atlantic salmon fly that would take me a probably a few hours to tie anyway. It's not going to be an average trout fly that I can tie in two or three minutes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway, so the answer to selectivity, once again, I say it it matters not whether the fish are on any of the bed of the river, in the water, midway on the water column, or at varying degrees before the surface. It is the visual on the surface for most people that they see what they determine as selectivity. Well, define that word. Well, pretty much, you know, from a fly fisher's point of view, it means that at any given time, there's a certain stage of that insect's life cycle that the fish are more tuned into. And obviously, in many cases, it's it's at the stage of transition from the uh, nymphal pupa to the winged insect. That that's it, and in, and in my experience, I would say that for eighty percent of the time, that is the most vulnerable area where your fly needs to fish to take that fish. Obviously, there are times when they you visually see them taking duns on the surface, and that's usually in slower water, and it's usually small insects too. In most cases, not all, but in a lot of cases it is. And therefore, you have to adopt your approach to that, which is ultimately, I will tell you, assuming you've got the right skills of presentation, the fly. That can be absolutely critical, the fly. People will tell you why it's it's all related to presentation. I'm not arguing that for one moment, but I will tell you that there are times if you don't have that right fly and the fish don't see it the way they want to see it, you ain't going to catch them. It's, I mean, that's a fact. And no one's arguing about that the presentation value is important. Of course it is. You can present it ultimately in perfection 20 different flies to that fish and it won't take them. Why? Because it sees them and it don't like what it sees. End the story. It's zone of vision. Particularly when they're feeding on small insects, it's very small. It's not wide. You know, where, when they feed on caddis, it, it, it significantly is because they're moving around under the water, left to right, up or down, whatever. When they're feeding on small insects, generally they're in slower, slack seams of water where they have more time to see them. And they're very, very, shall we say, persistent in the manner in which they actually take their insect. Another interesting thing about that, if you ever watch fish rise, and I spent hours and hours doing that because they fascinate me to watch them, you know, they'll come up 
gently open their mouth, engulf that fly, and they sink back down again. They don't often just stay at the surface gulping bugs as they come down. They usually go up, they go down, they come up, and they go down. And, of course, there's obviously different reasons why they do that. You know, they may well go down a few inches or more, which gives them vision to the surface in front of them of what's coming toward them. And then they know instinctively at what point of time to rise, open their mouth on that fly. You must likewise figure that out. You must likewise present your fly based by visual on that timing. In other words, you may be using the right fly, but every time you essentially cast in front of that fish, the fish don't see it because it's going past the fish. In other words, the fish has just risen, it's taken a natural, and as soon as it does, and it's sinking down a little bit into the uh, water column, your fly passes over it, head gone behind the fish, you didn't see it. So there are different things by skill of technique that you can deploy. One is observation. Again, observation. Watch that fish. Don't worry about just rushing out there, chucking the fly at the fish. If that fish is consistently feeding on a natural insect, it's probably going to do so for a, you know, a good period of time, so long as that hatch takes place. If you go out there and then suddenly start chucking and chancing it, the odds are you'll probably put that fish down. And you may be lucky. You may just catch your first cast out there, possibly. I will tell you that don't do that. I watch that fish, what he's doing. I want to see exactly the track that that fish is in. I also want to read that water. I want to see how that current is likely to influence my drift. You know, have I got a cast across the fast cross stream to get my fly into that soft water zone on the opposite side? If so, I'm going to consider where my approach is going to be to eliminate for the best part of it, adverse drag. Things like that you, you, you take in consideration. It's not just a question of what we call barging out there and start chucking and flies at that. And so going back to what I was saying about the behavior of the fish, you know, you watch them and they delicately take down this little size 20 blue winged olive or a spinner, for example. Typically spinners, you know, when they float dead on the surface, you may not actually see the fly you, because they are so low in the water surface, you don't see the dead spinners unless they're right under your feet or something. And a lot of people I know, they say, look at them fish are rising. You know, what are they eating? We can see no bugs on the water. Why? Well, you know what? They're eating spinners. They're, they're dead flies. That, that's what they are. You may see that here on the White River instead of the early in the morning. There ain't no natural flies flying around, they're eating dead spinners. Hell, you've got 100 miles of trout water on the White River. You know, that's a lot of water. And so you pay attention to that. You can fish a spinner of a, of a PMD or whatever it is, but watch the fish. So don't assume always that you're fishing the wrong fly. That may be the case. It's just that what you're doing doesn't allow the fish to see your fly at the time that is appropriate to that fish to rise to the surface and take it as it would a natural. So you can do things to try and put things more in your favor. For example, and this is assuming you not spook the fish by its senior leader or whatever the case may be, you present that fly further upstream. So instead of, and which is also a common mistake, incidentally, they catch the fly too close to where they see the rise. And incidentally, you know, often where you actually physically see the rise, it's not where it actually happened. It's, the fish's movement is actually upstream of where you see that disturbance of the water. And it may be dependent on the speed of water. It could be six inches, it could be a foot, could be two foot. But present your fly much, much further upstream. That gives a, a longer time delay. In other words, that fish may rise and sink down six inches and come back up. And it may be whatever, a second or two seconds. So if you try and figure out 
if you like, the delay time from the time that fish was last seen to the time that it comes up again, and you present your fly upstream at the same appropriate, shall we say, time that by the time your fly comes close to or near the fish, it sees it and it comes up and takes it. it. It's hard to explain it one to you, but your observance of what's going on will teach you those things. Ah, I know I had the right fly, but the fish are not seeing it. And once again, you know, we already talked about when you become really familiar with the water that you fish on a regular basis, the odds are you know what flies should catch those fish under most prevailing conditions. Maybe not. You may find one day you go out there full of good intentions. Yeah, we're going to have a good day. And all of a sudden, what the hell's going on here? I ain't catching nothing. They usually take my this, that, or the other, but I'm not catching no fish to die in it. Why? Huh. There's got to be a reason why. And it's not necessarily, necessarily that you're doing something wrong because you, you did that a hundred times and it's worked. It just may be on that particular day, the fish have no interest in accepting the flies that you're fishing at that time. So you've got to change for one reason or the other. So once again, observation. And that's why, you know, I said earlier on that I consider dry fly fishing, or shall we say fishing to fish on or near the surface that you can visually see most times, probably requires overall more relative skills of understanding based on all the necessary skills of the actual act of fishing and present, presentation of those flies and, of, and powers of observation. That said, as I already said, likewise, the same thing can apply to fish that you can't see. You, why is it that certain nymphs work exceptionally well on one day, but they don't the next? You think, what the hell is going on here? You know, the last four or five times I've been out fishing here, you know, I fished a, whatever, a Frenchie or a pheasant tail or a, whatever else you want to think about and done real, real well. And I come out here today and I made 30, 40 casts, no interest. Why? You know the odds of the fish being there are there. Unless something dramatically, seriously happened and the fish weren't there, the odds are they're still going to be there. Why is it that I can't get those fish to take my flies? I would accept that there are certain issues that that may cause that to be the case. Particularly here on a tailwater like mine, you know, at certain times of the year when our lakes turn over and the water's discharged from the lake to the river, the DO levels, the dissolved oxygen levels, get exceptionally low. And that being the case, I can assure you that fish are less likely to want to eat for obvious reasons because the parameters of oxygen levels in the water are so low. And you may have to go 9, 10, or 12 miles downstream before the DO levels in the water increase to a sufficient level that the fish are more interested to take. But that's typically usually a case related to tail water, sort of subject to lakes above where the water turns over. In other words, you know, the warm water starts sinking to the lower. And don't forget Bull Shoals Lake is over 200 foot deep, which is an exceptionally deep lake. And that's not always the case with others. But no, that may be the reason. Then the water temperature may be another reason. You know, seven dramatic changes in water temperature affect fish. I know that to be the case here. We may have an average, say, whatever, 55 degrees. They release generation out of the dam, and water comes down there at, say, 48 degrees. Well, that sudden change in water temperature will often shut the fish down. Water excessive levels of temperature in water can do the same thing. You know, when you get low levels of water in the summer months, you know, you get uh, temperatures in the river increase dramatically. You know, everything that's on the bank, you know, whether it be the whatever, the rocks or the gravel, you know, they absorb heat. And, you know, that fundamentally causes issues in the edges of the water to rise. I have seen times here where I've checked water temperatures in the margins, 75 degrees, you know, because 
there's so much, you've got 90, 100 degree days, those rocks and gravels that are right on the edge of the water are hot, really hot. Water tracks over that stuff. That temperature is absorbed into the water. And when you have low flows on the river, the further you go downstream, of course, the warmer the water gets. That may be another reason why they, but they're generally exceptions to the rule, to be honest about it. The fact of the matter is that you may well get there one, that one day and do what you've always done and get no positive results. Well, other than, you know, the things I've just explained, there may well be an issue with the flows you're using. And you would assume, well, uh, you know, well, if they take these on a regular basis, why don't they take them today? And I tell you, it's a weird thing. And I can tell you that from my own experience many, many, many times. You go there with, obviously, that initial approach and nothing's happening. Then you've got to start chopping and changing. And all of a sudden, you find the answer. So instead of taking, shall, shall we say, a uh, pheasant tail or a, a black pyramid or whatever else you want to think of, you put a different fly on and they attack it. You can't go wrong. You start pulling them out one after the other. Very strange. Why should that be? Why should those fish all of a sudden change from something that they've always reacted to to something that, well, you've never fished that before? I can't give you the answer to that. Uh, the fish can, but I can. I just know from years of fishing that never accept what you do as always the answer. You've got to be versatile. If you fish in a zone of water, for a, a relatively short period of time and had no positive results, one of two things happen or should happen. One is you better move or you change the me the method of fishing that you're, 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 you're doing. In other words, you've got to show something different to those fish because you persistently keep showing them the same thing over and over and over again. I can pretty much guarantee you they, they're going to get wised up and he won't take it. And big browns are like that. You know, the best chance you catch in a really good big trophy brown trout is the first time it ever sees the fly that you're putting in front of it. The more you do that, the less likely you are to catch it. And that's largely true with big rainbow trout. In fact, I would say this. And as you know, the White River here in Arkansas, you know, a 20-inch brown trout here, we don't consider it to be a trophy. It's got to be a 24-inch or more. And there was a lot of them in this river. But you try and catch a big rainbow. Big rainbows, in my opinion, are, can be more difficult to catch than big brown trout for lots of different reasons. But one primary one being that the big browns are much more aggressive than big rainbows. They, I'm not saying they don't eat larger food forms, but they're different. They really are different. So for me, it's a pleasure to see the days when we catch these bigger rainbows, you know, 24 to 25 inch rainbows, because you don't see them that often. You know they're there, but you don't catch them too much. So fly selection was something else that you would ask me about. Oh, that's a big, big question. I'll go back to what I was saying. You, you can probably take 10 flies and fish any trout water in the same size, by the way, and fish any trout water in the world, and one or more of those flies will guarantee to catch you fish. I'm not suggesting for one moment that those flies may be the ones that will catch you a boatload, but they will catch you some fish. Because what you're going to do or use are 10 flies that cover a lot of zones within the water column. You're going to fish nymphs, you're going to fish some dries, and you're going to fish some emergers, and you're going to fish a streamer, which definitely would be a water bugger, because overall, internationally, worldwide, you cannot beat that as a single fly of that nature to catch fish. Then you're going to use basic, simple pheasant tails, Hairs and nymphs. 
they're standard flies that trout almost anywhere in the world will eat. I, I, I guarantee you that. Then you're going to use a couple of dry flies. Number one, I'd probably put on my list would be an elk air caddis. Universally, it is a great fly. Next one I'd probably put on the list would be an, an Adams, which is, again, a consistently a good fly. It just generally attracts fish. And as far as self tackle is concerned, yeah, almost always there would have to be a partridge on here's ear. I, I can pretty much guarantee you that a fish are looking for something only near the surface and you twitch that fly in the right way, they'll come up and eat it. So within a relatively small selection of flies, you can catch fish in any waterway that they live. But us fly fishermen ain't like that, right? <laughs> we carry boxes of flies. If you saw what I had in my boat, you wouldn't believe it. And there is a reason why. It's not because I need them, to be honest. It's because when I tie flies for customers, I always tie three or four more than what the customer wants. And I'm always, obviously, building up more and more flies. So I put them in a fly box. And I put that, obviously, in a box in my boat. When I go fish myself, I take one fly box with me. Um, I don't need hundreds and hundreds of flies in a box. I know what I need. And it pretty much, there are a number of flies that cover the categories I, I just said, which would be some nymphs, some dry flies, some wet flies, and possibly a, uh, a woolly bug. I don't use that fly that often because I prefer to use other stuff. But that said, I know it's a very efficient, effective fish catching fly. And, and probably... You know, when I'm fishing newbies, newcomers, that's the first fly I'm going to put on their rig for them so they can cast it across stream and let it swing around and come back. And obviously the chances of them catching a fish are pretty good. I'm certainly not going to take them out there and expect them to present a dry fly with a dry free drift because that ain't going to happen. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, yeah, size 24 on 7X. Oh yeah, well yeah. yeah. <laughs> you you got you got to start to be getting up in there to the levels of, of of a little more skill to do stuff like that, right? Yeah, you know, I I fish waters in my lifetime that one could argue that those fish are nearly impossible to catch, and it's not so much because they've been pressurized by anglers. One has to accept that, you know, fish are persistently fished for by whatever means they are. It doesn't mean be fly fishing or whether spin or bait or whatever the case may be. There's no doubt that, you know, they, they, they do wise up. Um, I mean, they do. There's no argument about it. They do. And that's due to, obviously, the presence of anglers and the means of method that they deploy to try to catch them. But that said, I fish places that those fish have never been subjected to anything like that kind of pressure from a human being. But they are exceptionally difficult fish to deceive and catch. And obviously, we're talking about wild stream-born fish. They're so tuned in to their environment of the natural food sources that are abundant to them that if you do something that doesn't really come close to what they expect to see, you'll probably spook them and they'll take off. I mean, good luck. You know, we ain't going to catch them. They're, they're extremely wary of anything that they see or feel that is different. And when I say feel, I mean this. If you do not wade in a manner that basically reduces any water disturbance whatsoever, they're gone. When you wade in a river, you create pressure waves that go upstream as well as downstream. In other words, the water can't pass you, but it forces pressure waves upstream of you. And those fish are sensitive to that. They may not know you're there, but they sense something is wrong. For example, 
in nature, it could be an otter up swimming upstream toward them. You, you follow what I'm trying to tell you? Mm-hmm. There's something that changes water pressure that they sense or they hear or something different. Whip, there, they're gone. I mean, like a shot, they're gone. And they probably won't come back to that particular lie that they were in for quite some time. Because I've often watched wild browns, which we used to roam one of my local rivers over there in the UK, run off. And I've gone back an hour later or more, and he's still not returned back to that lie. And they may not. Oftentimes, after a time, they will. And once again, you know, you, your, your, your approach has got to be extremely careful and cautious. Once again, observation. You're observing what that fish is doing. You're not making an assumption by any stretch of the imagination. You're making an observation of that fish. What do I need to do to get an approach to that fish? That's the first thing. Not necessarily how I'm going to cast my fly to it, how am I going to get a approach to that fish before I make my uh, presentations? If you make the wrong approach, then the odds are you're not going to be able to control and make a good casting presentation, right? You, th- that's the first thing. So, And then, you know, the flies you fish to those fish, they can be really, really, but they're not fancy flies. Don't get me wrong. I mean, a lot of those fish you can deceive with fairly simple flies, like a hare's ear or, or um, once again, a pheasant tail. They're simplistic flies. They're not, by any stretch of imagination, pieces of artwork. It, but what you have to do is to, to present that fly to that fish so there's absolutely zero awareness of the fish that you as a human being or whatever the hell you're doing is not wary to that fish and you'll you're, you're catch them. I know if any of the guys listen to being fishing in New Zealand and the South Island where they know exactly what I'm talking about with those big old browns down there. You know, you make a bad pass or you screw something up, gone. They, all you've got to do is cast a fairly simple fly to that trout. And if he's not aware of your presence in any way, shape, or form, the odds are he'll take it. That's it. But it's from the difficulty arises with some of these fish, which are in gene clear water, incidentally, and I mean, extremely wary animals, is when they feed on or near the surface. Um, if there's anything, anything that they see as unnatural by disturbance or movement on that water surface, they will never take your fly. You may run them off, in fact, but they won't take your fly. Even though your fly is absolutely the perfect fly for them to take if they see it the right way. But if you do something that is not what they expect to see, they're gone. Once again, observation based on the fact that you've got skill levels. Anyway, you know, as I said, fly fishing, for me, you know, has always been a fascination in in my life, in all aspects. And as you know, I um, developed many, many different fly patterns that are appropriate for specific means of fishing, you know, whether it be... um, traditional flies or shall we say white flies, soft lackles, whether it emerges or whatever the case may be, because my years of experience fishing has taught me what to do to, to make that fish react to it, to those flies. Let's put it to you like that. That not to say that if I gave you some flies, I know for a fact will deceive that fish under those prevailing conditions. They're going to do the same for you because you may not present them in the same manner that I do. I, that's just how it is. You know what I'm saying? But that said, there are certain flies that are what you call pretty good standards that if you give a person a bunch of those flies, uh, the odds are, yeah, they're going to work for them, but they're not what I consider to be flies that require a little more, shall we say, precision insofar as how they're tied and how they're presented. Um, the interesting thing, I guess, 
on another aspect of like, you know, where fly time is concerned, like I said, you know, when I first started commercially tying flies, that wasn't something I could do 12 months a year. I was also a musician. I don't know if you knew that. I was a professional bluegrass banjo player. So I traveled around the world in the winter months and uh, with different bands, you know, and we work on U.S. military bases overseas. And that was a whole bunch of fun because over here in the U.K., the, the fishing season closes. You can't go fishing. Oh, it depends on the species, incidentally, but uh, essentially the fly season finishes. And in a lot of rivers, that doesn't open till March. And in the, like the um, talk streams, that don't really open until May. So you have a long period of time where unless you want to fish for other species, which I told you I did, I go fish for coarse fish species, I go fish for on the saltwater species, you can fish every day of the week if you want, being you, you would have to fish for different species based on the um seasons and where you could or you couldn't. Let's put it like that. So uh for the best part where the trout fly fishing scene was concerned, yeah, you had a closed season, so you had eleven months where uh, you had time to do other stuff. And obviously time flies was one of those. So, you know, I tied lots and lots of flies. I tied flies for London fly shops back in those times too. And they would obviously sell them to mail order and this, that, and the other. And that's another thing, you know, I developed my own mail order business back there in the late 60s and the 70s and uh, produced a catalog. And don't forget, back in them times, Hard for the younger generation to imagine that, but we didn't have cell phones or internet or none of that. You know, the only way you got media knowledge was you advertised in the fly fishing magazine with your phone number and somebody would call you up or write you a letter and order some flies from you. That kind of thing, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, I know. Everything today happens so damn fast. You know, somebody expects you to answer the phone every time they call you. Like, what? Well, they're doing something else, you know? Anyway, um, so you you get that. And so I tie a lot of flies in the winter period. And more to the point, things enable me to do things that Obviously, uh, in, in, in the early years, I couldn't. And, and most of that was related to materials. Um, it, synthetic materials. You know, I had it pretty much by the time, no, I'd, have, I'd have to say somewhere, you know, probably the late 70s or something like that. There was probably nothing I didn't need. I could get anything I wanted back then, even the exotic materials for a, you know, Atlantic salmon flies, whether it were contingents, Indian crows, and God knows what else. I could still get that easier. Today, good luck. Or if you find it, it's going to cost you a damn bloody fortune. Now I could go to the vineyard warehouse there in London because I I got to know them there pretty good. And I'd just go in there, and I, Jean was the manageress, and I, she'd say, hey, hey, you know, what are you looking for? I'd tell her, I want this, I want that, this, that, and the other. Yeah, yeah, she said. And we go out the back and all these big, huge cardboard boxes, you know. And they had all of this fantastic stuff in there, whatever it was. So it wasn't so much an issue then, you know. You, you could get all the snipe skins you wanted, the woodcock, all of that stuff. No, no problem. That's not, not so today, obviously, because the demand exceeds the um, availability, particularly of stuff like that, most of which was legally harvested for a limited period of time within the hunting season and sold to the likes of the vineyard, uh, you know, obviously process it, whatever, and package it and sell it. But they still have today limitations of what they can get. Let's put it to you like that. But anyway, really what I was saying to you was that for me, when synthetic materials became more available, that opened up a whole near new era as far as what you could do insofar as innovation of flies. I, I think to some extent today, if I was to be honest personally myself, I think in some respect the use of synthetics has gone a little too far insofar as creating artificial flies. I, and don't get me wrong by what I'm saying. And the reason I say that 
bearing in mind my history is that I'm still very much a traditionalist in that sense of the word. You know, I still have a love of flyers that existed 150 years ago or more, you know, because I still think there's some, there's a great intrinsic value in a lot of those flies that don't exist with, shall we say, more modern flies. It does the way to explain it to you. You know, and that's not by any stretch of imagination to uh, disregard the relevant skills of, of what some of those tires now produce because they, they're exceptionally good. I, I don't dispute that for one moment. And most certainly, obviously, myself, I, I can do the same if I want to do it. But I still have a natural instinct to favor the flies of the past. If that's the way to explain that one, we uh, of course, some introduction of the use of synthetic material. And I would always argue this, too, that, you know, if you wanted to discuss the aspects of fly time more, um, a skilled fly tire, in other words, the guys that I would hold on a pedestal, uh, as far as skillful fly tires that I know personally, or otherwise, overall, uh, that are capable of tying everything. In other words, they can tie a size 24 midge, and they can tie a large classic Atlantic salmon fly. There are very few tires in the world that can do that. And they may choose not to want to tie salmon flies. That's okay. I don't have a problem with that. Whereas salmon fly tie might not be interested in tying little midges. Fine, I understand that. Either way, they have acquired very high levels of skills with what they do do. But on the other hand, are they accomplished across the board at everything? Probably not. But that's okay. I'm just kind of making a statement there that to me, the most accomplished fly tires in the world that I know that can really do everything are few and far between. And you could also know the same thing about fly fishermen too. You know, that's the same thing to some extent. You know, it's just how you, or I personally view that. Let's, let's just say that. So, you know, fly time has changed dramatically too, you know, today. And I'd say almost certainly due to uh, social media. I, I can guarantee you that to be the case. All of a sudden, they could just go on there to YouTube, oh, yeah, well, how do I tie this? Type it in. There come up 10 different variations where you tie the same fly. Good, bad, or indifferent, whatever the case may be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The, the availability of fly time material today um, is not what it used to be. It's a, what I mean by that, so far as the availability of, of given natural material, and that's brought about by lots of different reasons. The one is the demand, obviously, but also the now legal restrictions of import of fur and feather from overseas sources, particularly feather because of Asian boil flu and various things like that, or the veterinary licensing certifications of importation, and the same thing vice versa, you know, export of uh, materials from this country to overseas sources, the same thing, you know, that come under restriction. So the availability of a lot of imported natural material, so to speak, it, it's less today than at one time it used to be. Fortunately for us here, there are a number of people that, you know, commercially raise uh, feather, you know, primarily poultry, obviously, you know, with capes and stuff like that and this that, and the other and of course we have natural resources of uh, fur from animals which are legally harvested during the hunting season this that, and the other so you know there's still an abundance of fortunately natural material and the, the synthetic material market is is unbelievable anymore I, I would hate to be I own fly shops in, in, in the UK I would hate to have to be a fly shop owner today and having to decide what the hell do I carry in fly time material? Uh, it's uh, the, it's unbelievable. And most people wouldn't be aware of that because they don't have to trade catalogs to know what's there. But that said, it is unbelievable the amount of material that is available today in as far as, shall we say, synthetics for fly tires. Unbelievable. 
you have to have one hell of a lot amount of money tied up in Tritone product in your store to even come close to carrying all of that. It's not going to happen. And so I guess what a uh, retail fly shop really has to do is cater for most of the time, you know, the local community and the nature of the type of materials they use for the flies that they generally use within their uh, location, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? And then you've got, of course, some of the mail order businesses, they try to carry a lot of stuff. You know, Feathercraft is one of the better ones. They're pretty good at carrying pretty much mostly what you need. But they won't have it all, but they'll have a lot of it. So it's a big, big business compared to what it ever used to be years and years ago. Yeah, it's a good thing, I guess, in many ways, you know, because everybody along the line is making some income from marketing the product and the guys that buy the stuff are having fun tying the flies up with them. Yeah, sure. But, <laughs> you know, yeah. I yeah. I will. Yeah. yeah. Everybody wins, right? It sounds like we'll have to to bring you back and we'll do another show and we'll call it the complete fly tire. Oh, yeah, that's right. yeah, I think there's as much interesting stuff, Davey, to unpack about that, kind of back to your point about, you know, when you can't get everything really easily, you have to be really resourceful and thoughtful about your materials, right? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so today we've got this like blessing where we have substitutes for natural materials, but we have a lot more stuff. And so, you know, it's a different interaction with the sport where you just basically go to the internet and have it shipped to your house. Right. And you tie with it. That's why, you know, when Seofa became somewhat banned over there in the UK, that's why I, I, I developed the SLF dubbing materials initially, you know, and that started off with the, the standard SLF. And then I developed a lot of different other blends related to, you know, I did all the stuff from my friend Oliver Edwards, all the master class blends. I did those. I did the Dave Whitlock um, dubbing blends and the Paul Yogurts and dubbing blends and a whole bunch of stuff. And I learned more about the processes of putting synthetic and natural material Together in, and the dime processes in those years, right? Like, yeah, unbelievable. I sold that business to the Wapsie Blake Company here in Mountain Home quite some time ago, and they don't produce all of the original blends I did, but they certainly do a lot of it. So, you know, if you people see, you know, SLF dubbing products, then they come back to me because that's how I started that. It's SLF standard for um, synthetic living fiber. And then my friend, he said, no, 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 rest the left. You're going like seals live forever. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> I said, yeah. yeah. I think if I look over here on my tying table, I bet you I have a uh, a storage box probably with 30 packages of like spiky squirrel and all that stuff in it. Oh, yeah, the squirrel dabbing, yeah, the hairs, hairs here, all that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we've talked about, Davey, how important um, education is. And so, you know, I would say I would ask you a couple things. You know, um, it, I know you're getting ready to kind of shift gears and get away from being on the water and being in the field until kind of next season. But, you know, can folks can folks expect to see you uh, on the show circuit anywhere in 2024? Yeah, okay. Next year, and the biggest show we have here in Mountain Home, and some of the listeners almost certainly was been here and attended that, will be the Sailboat event. That's a big, big event here, hosted by the North Africa by Fishers. And that will be in March of next year. And uh, ironically, I am the guest of honor at the event this next year, and that will be on the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of March. And we have about 100 fly tires there um, from different parts of the country, and we put a lot of programs, and it, it's a great event. And, of course, if you come here, you're within a few miles of the White River, so you can always go fishing as well. I must say, in the water... Maybe high or low, I can't tell you what generation is going to be, but nevertheless, um, you've got plenty of opportunity because you've got the Spring with the, the White River, the Norfolk River, the Little Red River, and the Little Missouri, and they're all trout water habitats in this area. 
Yeah. And, and so do you, do you have a kind of an idea of what your class offerings are going to be in 2024? So far as the sound is concerned, I will be obviously doing uh, programs related, obviously, because the theme of this, the um, event is the uh, wet fly. And so I'll be obviously doing classes related to understanding means, methods, techniques, tackling this, that, and the other, and demonstrating <clears throat> fly time techniques for those particular kind of flies. So, yeah, so that's the dates that I just give you in March for that event. You know, Davey, um, you know, if folks wanted to uh, either book you for a lesson or get a day on the water, uh, what's the best way for folks to kind of learn more about what you offer and how to find you and all that kind of good stuff? Oh, yeah. Well, okay. Then go to my website, which is DaveyWaltonFlyFishing.com. Okay. And then they can get the relevant information off it about the classes, the schools and whatever else. Well, they can call me or text me um, from my, you know, personal telephone number. And that's on that uh, website address. So, yeah, anybody that has an interest to uh, want to come here and spend some time and learn some stuff and accept, shall we say, justifiable criticism. You know, if I tell you, well, you're doing this wrong, it's nothing personal. I'm telling you that you're doing something wrong, you know, and ultimately I'm going to try to get that fault corrected i i cannot guarantee you that for some of the reasons that we talked about this evening but you know um i can certainly educate you on pretty much i know what th- th- you would know let's put it this way and regardless of whether it be nymph fishing dry fly wet fly whatever you know it's um and we have a wonderful resource there on the white river then you never know. You may well hook one of our big trophy brown trout. You, you never know. You know, it's <laughs> well there. Yeah. yeah. I, I've seen the pictures and, uh, you know, are you on social media at all or have you been lucky enough to avoid that whole mess? Yeah, I do. I I do at times post on the uh, some of the really exceptional fish. But, you know, honest to God, I I get so busy, you know, when you do a guide day, you know, you get up in the morning about 6 o'clock, 6.30, get everything ready. You may have to drive, you know, 30, 40 miles, not always to where you're going to fish that day. You you, you spend the, the day out on the river with your cu- customers. You've got to drive back home, and you've got to deal with a lot of email with correspondence. I may have to tie back up flies because they lost them or something else or whatever the case may be. Now I've got the animals you have to take care of as well. That's just like the other. You, there's a limit to what you can get done in a day. And um, not to mention yard work and this, that, and the other. I write articles from magazines. If any of the listeners here, if you go onto the North Arkansas Fly Fishers website, which is NAF, N-A-F-F, every month I write an article on there that's got, in not all cases, but sometimes it's a lot of history. So I deal with some historical aspects, aspects of fly fishing and the flies that are related. There's so many different things I, I, I do on there. You know, for example, this next month, uh, my article is related to soft tackles, but not what most people know. It's related to the Irish-style soft tackles, which are used for the Danica Thermal and the Mayfly emergence. And that ain't tied on a size 12 or 14 hook. They're, tight, they're big. They're tied on size 12 and 10. And I show examples of those slides. So if the listeners have got an interest, they can go onto our website and uh, they can pull up a lot of the stuff that I've written over the years. And I know they'll find a lot of that pretty darn interesting. So, yeah, but ultimately, yeah, you want to get hold of me, go to my website or just call me directly on my number which you've got, 870-404-5223, and text me. I can't always get back to you right away, but I will. Yeah, and I will drop a link because that sounds like a great resource to uh, to get those articles. I'll drop that in the show notes too. And, uh, you know, Davey, I really appreciate you, uh, even though you only got it a half a day today, I really appreciate you spending so much time with me this evening. Yeah, nearly three hours. <laughs> I haven't, I didn't quite set the Sapinski record, but I got pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah i'm sure yeah so by all means if you want to 
delve into the uh, to, uh, the aspects of fly time historically to where we are now. Yeah, but I'd love to do that. Just let me know. Uh, I would love to, too. Thank you so much again for making the time, Davey. No, you, you're most welcome, Marlene. Take care of yourself. I'll do it. All right, my friend. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Again, if you like the podcast, please tell a friend and please subscribe and leave us a rating review in the podcast of your choice. And be sure to check out our Patreon community and head over to www.nor-vice.com to see if Norvice will be coming to a show near you and to check out all of Tim and Michelle's cool products. Tight lines, everybody. <laughs>